story at all is misunderstood by many people today when we tend to think that Darwin, when he came out with this theory of evolution, was confronting a world where everyone was a creationist and everyone thought the world was only 6,000 years old and all the species in it had been created uh, at once recently. And this is simply not the case. Before Darwin comes on the scene at all, uh, religious, pious, Christian men of science had already uncovered the fact that the world was very, very ancient. It was certainly not 6,000 years old. They didn't know how old it was, but they knew it was countless millions of years. That's a, that's a pre-Darwin uh, Christian discovery. Also, that the fossil record showed that many species had been, well, had appeared and disappeared again and again and again during the history of life on Earth. And that it was basically a progressive uh, picture in the sense that in the most ancient rocks, you had very primitive life forms and that as you moved up through the uh, eons, um, things more similar to those alive today appeared. So of course you had uh, fish and then you had reptiles and then you had mammals. So at, that was accepted by everyone before Darwin comes along. Now from our modern perspective, that seems like you're already 50% on your way to uh, understanding uh, the evolution of life on earth. But of course they didn't see it that way. They didn't see it in, in an evolutionary perspective they saw it as a series of static creations. So it was, so they accepted what they found in the fossil record and in the rocks, and they reconciled it with, with their religion. So that's the picture um, that most people had about how life on earth works. Then of course, Darwin comes along and really it sort of just connects the dots and explains that all of those um, species that have come and gone in the, in the fossil record have ch had changed. They had evolved one into the other, although many had simply gone extinct. So he here's a here's a, a, a Victorian illustration uh, showing showing you this. Uh, this is just for your average reader, but here is um, showing uh, the, uh, the the most ancient era of life on Earth that they knew about, and then subsequent era, and then a more modern era. And these although they look familiar to us, these are species that don't actually live, uh, that mammals that don't live today. So it's a story of pro the progress of life on earth. And yet it was not an evolutionary picture, even though it seems so suggestive of evolution. So that's where, where, the, the, that's where things began. So when Darwin entered the scene with his theory of evolution, he didn't have to sweep away the age of the earth and convince people that uh, there had been many different uh, species that had come and gone. Everyone already accepted that. And uh, for some reason, the story has changed in recent times to people thinking that Darwin came along and he had to confront a um, young Earth creationist audience, which he didn't. Okay, now I'm going to move through uh, Darwin's life and look at some of the things that are said about Darwin in, in, in many biographies, magazines, documentaries, and so on. So here, first of all, uh, when Darwin went to uh, Christ College, Cambridge, uh, many sources will tell you that he studied theology or divinity um, because it was his father's intention that Darwin should become a clergyman after he gave up the study of medicine in Edinburgh. But it's not true that Darwin studied theology. In fact, there was no theology degree at Cambridge back then. So Darwin was just entered on the books as an ordinary uh, BA student, and his studies were identical to those of all the other students. So that's, that's one, one very pre prevalent myth. Another, of course, relates to the Voyage of the Beagle. This will be news to most of you, I think. But it's very often said nowadays, uh, especially by writers who have done a lot of research. Uh, they'll say that, well, Darwin wasn't the official naturalist on the voyage of the Beagle, but was in fact the captain's gentleman companion. 
this is the Captain Robert Fitzroy, uh, a man with an aristocratic background. Now, the story goes nowadays that supposedly Fitzroy thought that he would uh, be so isolated on the, on the forthcoming voyage that he might um, go insane and kill himself. <laughs> and therefore, he wanted to take along a gentleman to share his social standing because uh, the captains of Royal Navy ships were socially uh, distanced. That's a very modern phrase, isn't it? Socially distanced from the other officers and the crew. They, they stood apart, they ate alone and so on. Well, again, this, this one is just not true. Um, uh, Darwin actually was the official naturalist. And the alternative story is that the ship's surgeon was supposedly the real official naturalist. And this has been repeated by countless historians. I've probably repeated it myself at some point. And it's just been passed on as a truism from writer to writer to writer that back then the ship's surgeon was by default also the naturalist. Well, when I did my research on this topic and actually checked the accounts of, of many surgeons and naturalists and voyages, this simply was not true. It was not the default position that the surgeon was always the naturalist. Sometimes, sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. And furthermore, um, historians are rather pleased if we can take Darwin down a peg because we want, to, we want to appear serious and we don't want to be mistaken for um, hero worshippers. So if we can drop him down a peg on any point uh, that we, we love to do that. And I think that's why this story of not being the official naturalist has survived so well. But here is uh, Fitzroy's own book about the Voyage of the Beagle. And there he lists the, uh, the men who were on board who were not members of the Royal Navy, the, the extras, the supernumeraries. And there's Darwin listed as naturalist in his own, uh, one of his books uh, that resulted from the voyage, The Zoology of the Beagle. He refers on the, on the first page that um, he, he thanks Captain Beaufort through whom my appointment received the sanction of the Admiralty, my appointment as naturalist. So he really was the official naturalist despite the, um, the prevalence of this view nowadays that he wasn't. But you'll find that everywhere. But nothing could be more famous than Darwin's visit to the Galapagos Islands, right? No story of Darwin would be complete without talking about his, his experiences in the Galapagos Islands and his discoveries there. Interestingly, if you read the very earliest biographies of Darwin, and, and including the obituaries, when he died, there were hundreds of obituaries published that told the story of his life. More often than not, the Galapagos weren't mentioned in the early accounts of Darwin. So here is a change of emphasis and focus that has happened since his death, that the episode of his life where he was on the Galapagos Islands has swollen to become a bigger part of the story than it used to be. And in particular, of course, are uh, the finches. This is the illustration from his book, Journal of Researches, more commonly known as Voyage of the Beagle. So Darwin did discover these finches and he did remark on the shapes of their beaks. But what most textbooks and other sources will tell a modern reader nowadays about the effect of these beaks on Darwin isn't true. Uh, in other words, the, the, these finches are used as a, uh, an excellent example of ecological specialization and adaptive radiation. So one ancestor uh, finch species splitting into many different species, all specialized to different habitats or environments. Well, yes, they are a great example for this, but Darwin had no clue about it. This is not his discovery. It was made a hundred years later. And yet, sadly, it's always attributed uh, to, to Darwin. Darwin simply noticed that the beaks seemed to gradually 
change across these numerous species, which gave him eventually a clue that they were all descended from a common ancestor. But he knew nothing about them being adapted. In fact, Darwin said he had observed them feeding together in a flock, which he doesn't explain it, but I've always imagined or guessed that perhaps he saw this, these birds near a settlement. Perhaps there was some human rubbish there that the birds were, were feeding on. Why, why else would all these uh, species have been feeding together in one spot, which he observed? Who knows? But anyway, he, he, he didn't know about this. But the finches, uh, of course, that since 1936, they've been called Darwin's finches, which has aided in the belief that it was these finches that gave Darwin the clue to uncovering uh, evolution or uncovering natural selection. And now, uh, nowadays we know they didn't, but this hasn't stopped them from becoming so iconic that some people have even done this. Yes, they have been, <laughs> they have been <clears throat> tattooed onto the bodies of countless people who are into Darwin or into science or whatever. And uh, yeah, so they've had these iconic uh, finches emblazoned onto their actual skins. Okay, next one. And surely many of you have heard this. Darwin married his cousin Emma Wedgwood in January 1839. And uh, they, not long after they, they left uh, filthy, dirty London to settle in a quiet, sleepy village uh, called Down in Kent, not, not far from London. And there Darwin would live and work for the remainder of his life. Now he had already come up with the beginnings of his theory of evolution before they moved to Down, when he was still living in London, in his notebooks and so on. But he didn't publish it for 20 years. This also has become a big part of how people tell the story of Charles Darwin nowadays. And they've come to tell it rather like this. This is the website of the American Museum of Natural History's uh, huge Darwin exhibition in 2009. And I've underlined in red to draw your attention to it. Of all the things that they could say about Charles Darwin, and there's lots of things you could say, they chose this. For 21 years, he kept his theory secret. Ooh. And not to be outdone, the Natural History Museum in London used this poster. No text, just a gesture to, because they know that their audience is familiar with the story that, ooh, Darwin's theory was top secret. Ooh, it was so dangerous and so on. This photo is fake. Okay, this is photoshopped. That is not Darwin's hand. That is a museum employee at the Natural History Museum. And sadly, this photo has become perhaps the most popular photograph of Charles Darwin on the internet. People love this one. They love it more than the real thing. I mean, it's on billboards, it's on murals, it's in multiple languages, it's been painted by people, and wait, wait for it, and it's been tattooed on a lot of people. Oops, I would be very unhappy if I had had a faked photograph of Darwin tattooed onto my leg, because it's not real. And more importantly than the hand not being real, and the gesture not being real, but it's the entire emphasis on Darwin having kept his theory a secret. He didn't. This is something that people didn't start to say until about the 1960s, 1970s, people began to tell Darwin's story differently that, um, oh, he, he kept, kept his theory to himself for, for a long time. Now, it had always been known. After all, he tells us on the first page of The Origin of Species that he's been working on this for 20 years. Now, that's never been uh, out of the public domain. But no one ever suggested that he kept his theory a secret or that he held it back 
that he delayed it until the middle of the 20th century. And then people began to come up with different theories for why did he keep it a secret? And there have been many of those. Oh, by the way, this is the original photograph um, without the photoshopped hand. So to make a long story short, I'll just share with you one piece of evidence that shows us that Darwin did not keep his theory of evolution a secret during those years when he was working on it. And that's from the man himself. This is the last edition of The Origin of Species for, uh, that he published in his lifetime. He was getting a bit annoyed with some critics who thought he had exaggerated his originality. They were saying, oh, come on, it's the 1870s. We all believe in evolution now. What's the big deal? You make it sound like you, you came up with it. And he wanted to say, well, actually, yeah, I did. <laughs> because in the past, the rest of you didn't believe in evolution. And here's his evidence. I formerly spoke to very many naturalists on the subject of evolution and never once met with any sympathetic agreement. He talked to very many naturalists about it and no one agreed. That's not a secret. That's what you're interested in, what you're working on. And that was known by others. Now, one of the common uh, explanations given for this supposed delay by Darwin was the publication of this book in 1844, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. It was published anonymously. The author kept his, his name a secret. And this book, although it does talk about a form of evolution, it's really about the evolution of the entire cosmos. It's about laws of nature are inherently progressive. And this was considered by many people to be deeply irreligious and scandalous. And it was had a lot of scientific um, errors or mistakes. So I'm showing you here two contemporary cartoons showing how nobody wanted to uh, accept ownership of the book and people were giving it a real beating. Now, it is just routinely claimed as if it were a fact that Darwin saw what this evolutionary book was receiving, the, the outrage and so on, and thought, ooh, the same could happen to me and my theory of evolution, so I better keep it to myself. Now, this is just repeated endlessly, and there is simply no evidence for it. Now, we know Darwin read, the, read, read this book. I've handled his copy myself and looked at his notes at the back. He was not very impressed. He thought this was a just a popular science book by someone. The author does refer to himself at the beginning, saying he's not an expert. So he confessed this, that he wasn't an expert uh, scientist. So Darwin, like others, thought that this book was not very impressive, but he had no reason to think that his impressive theory would be treated the way this popular science book was treated. But it sounds plausible. It's a very plausible sounding claim to make. And so it's endly, endlessly repeated. In fact, Darwin had just written a lengthy rough draft of his theory of evolution just before this book appeared because Darwin was between two publishing projects. He just finished one book. He had another one back from the printers and corrected. And in the gap before he um, moved on to the next one, he wrote up this rough draft of his species theory and put it away. And then this book vestiges appeared. So it's simply not true to claim that Darwin saw the reaction to this book and therefore withheld his own theory of evolution. He did it, despite the fact that it's so endlessly repeated. The other thing that's uh, endlessly repeated is that he was afraid of offending his religious wife. Now, Darwin's wife, Emma, was a religious lady and Darwin um, ultimately became um, a non-believer. But this uh, story, again, it sounds so plausible, doesn't it? But it's simply made up. It's simply invented. There is no evidence whatsoever that Darwin ever di uh, didn't publish anything 
because of his wife's feelings. In fact, the only evidence we have at all is a letter that she once wrote to someone saying that she didn't like something that he had published in his book, The Expression of the Emotions, which he did publish, <laughs> despite the fact that she didn't really care for it. So it sounds so plausible to say, oh, he was afraid of offending his religious wife, so he held back his theory of evolution. It sounds plausible, but it's simply invented. There is no evidence for that. It didn't happen. And it's not uh, reflective of their dynamic. So in November 1859, his book was finally published on the origin of species by means of natural selection. And within 15 or 20 years or so, this one book single-handedly uh, turned around the view of the international scientific community from thinking that evolution was an absurdity to accepting that it was a fact. And that's quite an accomplishment for one book. And I think not uh, unreasonable um, to have been the result of 20 years of work uh, in order to be so persuasive and so effective. Here's another one, maybe you've heard of this. It is constantly repeated that Darwin was afraid that because he married his cousin, his first cousin, that this, the closeness of their union meant that their children would suffer and be sickly and weak. And this is, repeat, this is just repeated hundreds of times. When in fact, no, that's not true. In fact, if sometimes people will actually quote a letter or two to try and back up this uh, story that he was afraid that marrying his cousin had, had this effect. In fact, if you actually read those letters, what they say is quite explicit. He always says, I'm afraid that I may have passed on my poor health to my children because he was uh, often sick and poorly and he was afraid that he had passed it on. We've got this explicitly from his eldest son. Darwin felt very deeply the chance there was of his weak constitution being inherited by his children. Yes, this is what he said, Darwin said, in 100% of the cases. Uh, so where the idea came from that he was afraid of uh, having married his first cousin and this would have caused problems, I don't know where it comes from, but it certainly doesn't come from Charles Darwin. Now this one, I guarantee you've heard of this one. Darwin's favorite daughter, Annie, died when she was only 10 years old from a, a cruel uh, illness which Darwin witnessed firsthand. And uh, it's now repeated routinely that seeing her cruel death um, tore up the last shreds of his faith in Christianity. And that he, he lost his faith as a result, that he gave up uh, his belief. Well, no, it didn't. In fact, the evidence shows that Darwin had lost his faith long before, after he returned home from the voyage of the Beagle. The time, this is the time when he also came up with his theory of evolution. Darwin was asking himself big, profound questions. He was a young man trying to sort everything out. And that's when he thought a lot about religion. And all of his reasons, and I encourage you to go, go online and, and find his autobiography. I mean, it's, there are many copies. His section on religious belief, it's quite short, but very interesting. And it outlines absolutely clearly why he thought that he uh, no longer believed in Christianity. And they're all about evidence. And then he says at the end of, the, of his discussion that this process happened so slowly and gradually, losing his faith, happened so slowly and gradually that I felt no distress and I have never since, for a single second, doubted my conclusion, just to make it absolutely clear. But the death of his daughter, Annie, was the most distressing event of his life. The most distressing event, and he says losing his faith, involved no distress whatsoever. No, her, her death had nothing to do with it. 
um, makes a good story. It's it's more dramatic, but unfortunately, the truth is a bit <laughs> less entertaining and uh, more mundane. And uh, I will also just mention this one. Darwin's main defender was uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, who has been called, I would, I would hazard to say, tens of thousands of times for the last hundred years, he's been referred to as Darwin's bulldog, that he earned the nickname Darwin's bulldog because he was such a tenacious defender of Darwin and his theory of evolution. Even this turns out not to be true. Uh, the, the nickname is posthumous. He was never once called this while he was alive. This phrase was never used in print during Darwin's lifetime. Yeah, sorry. It's, it's a great nickname, but it didn't exist uh, at the time. It was used first in a speech about Huxley on the occasion of his death. That is the first time the phrase ever appeared in print. And this is the way of things, right? Stories are told, retold, 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 until eventually we are so distant from the original sources and all we have read are the accounts of other people who've just copied the people before them. And things like this uh, get into the literature and they stick. And it's hard to, uh, well, basically it's impossible to eradicate them, I would say. Sorry. Here's another one. Many people like to claim that uh, Darwin uh, converted back to Christianity or denounced his theory of evolution on his deathbed. Well, no, he didn't. Uh, his family was there. They wrote down uh, everything that happened. He was in a lot of pain and, and, uh, and, and died of... Uh, heart failure, but he didn't do anything of the kind. But these stories tend to be repeated by people who I, in my opinion, wish it was true. But I think it's a bit of a waste of time because whether or not Darwin had converted to Christianity or not wouldn't make any difference to his science. And science is not something that you can just say, oh, sorry, I take that back. I was wrong about that. By the time Darwin had died, thousands of scientists around the world were already using his theory and had confirmed it endlessly. So it wouldn't make any difference what Darwin said uh, on his deathbed if he had renounced. Uh, it, it would make no difference to the truth. Nevertheless, these so stories are very popular and uh, uh, still circulate widely. The other thing that uh, you will, a modern reader will believe or assume is that um, Darwin's theory has been deeply controversial all the way back to the very beginning. That's also not true. Darwin's theory, as I mentioned before, was very quickly successful. So that by the end of his lifetime, he was lauded around the world as a great scientific uh, revolutionary and so on, because the international scientific community and the educated public had accepted that uh, Darwin was right, that evolution happens and that humans are descended from earlier species. Now, a lot of people didn't like this at first, but the fight over it went, went away by the time he was dead. Here's just a smattering of obituaries that after he died tell the story of his life and they all say basically the same thing that he's the one who showed us that uh, life evolves it was not a controversial point it was only later in the 20th century that a new creationist movement arose in america um, and its descendants are still going today but this gives the false impression that darwin's theory has always been uh, in conflict with some religions, which it, it actually has. Been. And I think people need to be reminded of that. Now, when, when it comes to commemorating Darwin, uh, there's no better um, place for me to touch base than with this man, R.B. Freeman, who was a very great 
a scholar, a zoologist, and bibliographer, and historian. And he created some groundbreaking works on Darwin, especially his um, extremely authoritative bibliography of all of the writings of Darwin, identifying all, every printing and all, every difference uh, between every edition and so on. Uh, so this is still cited as particularly by uh, collectors who want to be able to identify exactly which Darwin publication uh, they have. Well, Freeman also published this book in 1978 called Charles Darwin, A Companion. And this book was, well, unique for its own time and I think still unique. Uh, this is what the dust jacket said about it. This companion is the first of its kind to draw together the widely scattered facts about Charles Darwin's life and, and works and is based on many years of reading and research. Indeed, the amount of writing on Darwin, the number of sources is so vast that I don't know how anyone could start out <laughs> and want to become a Darwin scholar because it is so daunting. No one could ever master uh, this, this vast array of sources. We have a huge manuscript archive left behind by Darwin and his family I and mean, mountains of notes and paper and notebooks and letters and also by people who knew him. And then there's all the things that have been written about him since then. Uh, it's absolutely mind bogglingly vast. But what Friedman did was to try and create an overview of what's out there, what's known, what you can look up. And there was just no other source that uh, would, could tell you so much as his book. Now it's been out of print since 1978. In 2009, no, sorry, in 2007, I was given permission by the Charles Darwin Trust who had purchased the um, copyright of this book <clears throat> to be allowed to um, use Freeman's unpublished corrections and make a second edition uh, on, on, on Darwin Online. And uh, so these are the corrections. Uh, these are his own books, uh, which I still have, filled with his corrections and editions. Well, the first and second editions of his book have been visited more than half a million times on Darwin Online since 2007. So clearly there's a lot of valuable information uh, in there. Well, in 2009, I was approached by uh, this man, Paul von Helfert. Uh, Darwin, uh, 2009 was Darwin year. There were uh, events all over the world. I spoke in about, I think, 50 public talks, including uh, two in Singapore. And I published four books and everybody else was publishing books uh, on Darwin, very busy. But Paul met me at um, one of the big Darwin conferences and said, why not um, revise and make a new edition of Freeman's book, Companion? Um, would you like to, to join me? I said, oh, oh okay, okay, uh, I, will, I will help you with that. Um, and now that, that project trundled along at a rather leisurely pace, and I have to confess, I often um, lost interest in it and was diverted to work on other book projects until um, I was cheerfully joined by this lady, who some of you will know, um, who has been volunteering on Darwin Online for a long time, and who injected the entire project with a new sense of energy and enthusiasm and thoroughness and, and accuracy. And the book that has resulted wouldn't be anywhere close to what it is without uh, Christine's assistance. And I know she'll be blushing that I'm saying this, but it's the truth. <laughs> so this is the book that we've uh, come out with. It's just appeared, it's actually, it's, nice to touch it in the flesh. So what we've done is we start with Freeman's original book, but we've gone far, far beyond um, his original offering. So here's just some highlights. It's got basically Darwin's entire life <laughs> is covered 
with an entry on everyone that he interacted with. And there's lots and lots of new discoveries in the book. So for example, that there were 29 books dedicated to him, not, not seven, uh, or that there were 92 scientific societies that elected him a member, or that 247 stamps and banknotes and coins uh, depict him. And as you can see, 70 institutions, 92 streets, buildings, ships, 130 monuments. His works have been translated into 64 languages. And his name has been a, a given to species of plants and animals uh, about 700 times, which makes him by far the, the record holder uh, on that. Um, he's famously re represented as a recluse, but we've put together a list of um, more than 400 people who visited the Darwins. So not such a recluse after all. Um, we've put together a, an itinerary of his entire life. So you can look up where, where, where was he <laughs> at any uh, particular time, although such a project can never really be complete. Uh, and then the part that I particularly devoted myself to were um, uh, what are called iconographies, which are lists of portraits. Now Freeman had listed 55 portraits of Darwin. Uh, this new companion has uh, over 1,000 unique portraits, and that does not count the identical reproduction of the same thing over and over. That, that, that only counts as one. So that's unique artworks uh, and photographs. But I also did the same thing for the Beagle, and, and I made a, discovered a few new ones, so no one will have seen this particular uh, drawing of the Beagle. And I've only included those that were done uh, by eyewitnesses. So imaginary paintings from years later, I, I have ignored. Similarly, with a list of the drawings and photographs of his house and grounds, of his wife, Emma. Victorian ladies were not photographed uh, so much as their famous husbands, it seems. Um, so Darwin, in three dimensions, that is statues, and busts, and things like that, there's been at least 240 of these uh, created to depict him, which again is unprecedented for any scientist. Uh, oil paintings, I stopped counting from the year 2009. Uh, so I've identified uh, 71 uh, paintings just in that medium of oil. Whereas watercolors, drawings, and stained glass windows, I found 142 works that depict Darwin. And then there are the prints, that is printed uh, portraits in books or on dust jackets, book covers, um, and, and so on. And those, I, I could probably keep looking for the rest of my life because they just keep turning up. <laughs> there are so many. So it, yeah, there's at least 600. There are probably a few thousand uh, unique ones. And, and included here, are me most of these will be new to every reader who's interested in Darwin. Here's another collection of them just because I have so many to share with you. So these have not been seen by but any, not, no Darwin expert has ever seen these before. Uh, some of them are from a very obscure uh, books. And then perhaps my favorite part are the photographs. I've uh, put together what I hope is a complete list of all the photographs of Charles Darwin, including seven new discoveries. And uh, most of these will not have been seen by uh, your general reader before, because uh, books on Darwin always reproduce the same handful. And there's a lot more. And things are particularly um, valuable and interesting. And I've done all the research on who the photographer was and where they were done and so on. So that's, I think, well, perhaps the, my fav favorite part of the book. Then there are um, caricatures. Um, of which I'm sure you've all seen some of these. Darwin was poked fun of quite a lot um, after he published his book, The Descent of Man. You know, oh, he's the monkey man. He's the one who says we come from monkeys and so on. So as far as I know, there are at least 53 of those. So I'm, I'm very pleased that the, the book has um, finally come out. And I can uh, honestly say that there, no book on Charles Darwin has ever been published 
that is so packed with new things that um, that readers will not have seen before or will not have known before. And that's the point. So the very cover of the book itself has a photograph that had not been previously published. And the back cover, wait, if I go way back to my slides, whoops. Ah. Oops, I stopped. Sorry. Is my screen sharing return? Uh, yes, but you're in slight sort of view. Yeah, you to... sorry. Okay, cool. I just wanted to go back and show you the... Oh, there we go. Uh, the back cover of the book, that is a painting of Darwin's study by his niece. And this has never been published before. And after he died, his study was left exactly the way he left it. And it was, uh, it was photographed and depicted a few times, but here's a nice color painting um, by a member of his family uh, that no one has ever seen before. It's been locked away in an archive uh, all these years. So, yeah. So to, to summarize, a lot of things have been said about Darwin that have accumulated over the years that have been getting things wrong. And there's a lot of things we could get right. And there's a lot more uh, to learn because it's a huge field of, of study. And for anybody who's interested in, in evolution, I'm sure that, that the story of Darwin is always going to remain uh, an inspiring one. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. All right, now I've got the link uh, to the book, uh, for the Singaporean link, as well as the introdu introduction that is freely available online. And if you look in the chat, you will be able to see the links. If you are uh, joining us from outside of Singapore, firstly, thank you so much for joining us from outside of Singapore. I've also got these links that will bring you uh, to Amazon as well as Amazon UK. All right, um, I'd like to open the space for any questions. So if you don't have questions, it could be comments or even any myths uh, or beliefs you've had about Darwin that perhaps did not get busted this afternoon. I'm still a bit upset about the whole bulldog one. I really like the Hus Huxley bulldog. <laughs> so anything, just go ahead and uh, uh, unmute yourself during the discussion. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I published, um, I guess it was last year, in the, uh, no, two years ago now, in the Journal of the Linnaean Society, um, the, um, the bulldog um, story. And I called the article, Why There Was No Darwin's Bulldog. <laughs> Just for a little bit of shock value. <laughs> um, I see Adam Wargan has uh, raised his hand. If you want to unmute yourself to ask a question, you can go ahead. Hi, Adam. Thanks, uh, Shamimi. Hi, John. Um, in so pre Darwin, um, you know they had the puzzle pieces for evolution, but they did, so what did they? What was uh, what did they believe? If not evolution, they knew the Earth was old. They had fossils. They had they knew the, you know everything. Yes, yes. So well, um, maybe. It won't come as a surprise uh, to learn that it was basically an amalgam of these new discoveries with their existing beliefs. So they saw all these different eras of uh, life on Earth in, in, the, in the rock layers as separate creations. So they thought that, okay, um, we didn't know this before, um, but it's obviously here in the rocks that life uh, has been created many times. So God has been very busy and, uh, and, and people saw this as a more exalted view of the creator that he had had, that he had done so much work in the history of life on our planet. So no, they, things didn't uh, evolve one into another, but they, there had just been lots and lots and lots of creations. And, and in terms of uh, mass extinction events, uh, was a comet or meteor impact, was that known during Darwin's time? Or what was their theory about why Earth, the fossils seem to reset every few hundred million years and so on? That was a mystery to them. Um, they had not discovered any uh, 
global catastrophes. I mean, they started off, of course, with the belief that there had been a great uh, universal flood. And then the, the, the er earliest generations of geologists demonstrated that no, no there is no evidence that any uh, event has affected the entire world. There, there are local um, pieces of evidence, like there was a flood in this valley or these boulders were washed down from this mountain, but it didn't all fit together into a single event. So yeah, uh, worldwide catastrophes were not, were not known uh, and they didn't know why so many things had gone extinct in the past. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, Jerry and Kemi, I see you're unmuted, but I do have a question in the chat from uh, Ching Hao Wing. By the way, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat too. Dr. John, what's your favorite possession related to Darwin? Favorite possession? Yeah. <laughs> what have you collected over the years? Oh, I don't have one, but I do, wait, I do have something I can show you, which is just, just one second. Oh, no, 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 it's here, it's here, it's here. You just drop it. I, I don't know, I hope not. It <laughs> oh, no, it's like broken. A, it didn't sound like a glass breaking thing. It sounded okay. Well, yeah. years ago, I saw in a, a rare bookshop um, a copy of a notebook from 1834, which I recognized instantly as being uh, the identical uh, model, the identical type that uh, Darwin had owned when he was a student although his was in much shabbier condition than mine is. <laughs> so it's a beautiful uh, pocket diary. So it would have been made has... around the same time as well, something from- Yes, the... it's, right. this is from 18, 1834. Right, right, right. right. It has beautiful right. marbled end pages and it's full with um, the most uh, beautiful engravings, but, but it's, it's, it's essentially, it's got lists of post office timetables, uh, but essentially um, it's just empty diary pages. Yep, it's a planner. Yeah, yeah. So Darwin had that one, and so I, I got the same one. Um, yes. These are some favorites of mine. I've got a few original um, Victorian photographs of Darwin. They're called Carte de Visite, visiting cards. And these were mass produced by the tens of thousands. Uh, so you would just give them to all your friends and your correspondents and so on. So they're very numerous and they're not that, not that valuable, although they're worth a bit more if it's somebody famous. <clears throat> so I've got, I've got four of Darwin. Uh, I, I think I got them all on eBay, but two are special because this one, a bit faded, um, but I happen to know that this photograph was taken by a man named uh, Ernest Edwards. And happily, this particular one is actually signed by the photographer, Ernest Edwards. So when I saw that on eBay, the person selling it had no idea. It was just a random name on the back of this card. But I knew, ooh, ooh, that's the, that's the photographer. And then I found another one uh, sometime later. This is one of my favorite photographs of Darwin. Um, this is taken in 1871 by a Swedish born photographer named uh, Oscar Raylander. And this one is also signed uh, by Raylander. So this is the photographer uh, has signed his own a print, one of his uh, own prints. There are, Raylander helped Darwin with his research on the expression of the emotions. He took photographs of children and, and, and adults expressing different emotions so Darwin could study how the muscles uh, move and so on. And some of the uh, photographs in the Darwin archive in Cambridge University Library are uh, signed by Raylander in exactly the same way. So it was obviously something he, he often did. So those, I, I would say those are my <laughs> highlights of my collection. Thank you. Thank you for this little show and tell. And thank you for asking the question, Howing. Um, th that was quite a treat. Uh, okay. I see Kemi has got, uh, it's on mute. Did you have a question? Or else I see Adam has got his hand raised again. No, no question. Adam, did you have a question? 
Yes, John, I have another question. Um, so this is a broader question. You, you know, you've had a front row seat to the, the mythology of Darwin. Um, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes. Okay. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested, you mentioned, you touched on this a bit, you know, how quickly, basically what I'm getting at is a broader pattern of people being, um, you know, of idolatry, basically. And we see this with, you know, like Muhammad and Buddha and Jesus and everything where, you know, in a few hundred years after their death, they build up these fantastical myths about, about their lives. And, um, you know, and then there's a broader question of what, what is this? Is this just humans being natural storytellers? And as you, as you pointed out, we love a good story more than, than the truth. Or is this a result of you know, par, par, possibly human evolution where we had a, a medicine man or a shaman where we, we, we like to look up to someone? Um, I'm just in, intrigued and, and, and curious about how it maybe has it affected how you view legendary stories of mythical people, you know, anywhere when you've had a front row seat to how this thing can develop so easily. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I, I do. Because having, <clears throat> having investigated one or two historical individuals uh, uh, with forensic detail, and what I have particularly focused on has been the telling of their stories. So that I don't think there are many people who have read, you know, 200 biographies of Darwin, because we don't read old old ones. We just read the, the most recent ones to come out. So I've been able to see how his story has changed and how different things have come to be uh, emphasized at different, different eras, yeah? But there does seem to me, and it's a kind of a depressing fact that it seems to me that as time goes on, just more and more mistake, mistakes accumulate. And the earliest sources are sometimes the most accurate because they just haven't accumulated so much rubbish, which a modern publication uh, will usually have in it. Um, and so if it's that way for Darwin, I can only assume it's that way for other famous historical figures, that as time goes on, more and more myths and legends uh, accumulate, right? And, and, and they can't be stopped. <laughs> and once they get added into the mix, they become part of the, of the general story and just get passed on and repeated. So yeah, I think it's inevitable. But it gives a, but it gives a story like me something to do. <laughs> to say, wait, wait a second, this thing that we all uh, have heard about, uh, you know, didn't actually happen. Um, like Darwin's finches or, 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 or Darwin's bulldog or whatever it is. Kept you busy, <laughs> bursting <laughs> everyone else's bubbles. <laughs> well, it can get you in a lot of trouble as well. Um, the, the first, I mean, my first article on Darwin, which was not published for a lot, many years, was actually on where did the myth of Darwin's finches come from? Now, it had been disproven by a historian in the 1980s that Darwin did not have a eureka moment when he saw the beaks of the finches on the Galapagos Islands. And it occurred to me to ask, well, hang on, if Darwin didn't say that and that didn't happen, how did everyone in the world come to believe that it did? Where did that story come from? And that is what first led me to reading all the biographical accounts of Darwin I could find, going back to when he was alive and, and, and through the decades. And then I came across something I didn't expect, which is that the idea that Darwin had held back his theory or kept it a secret had actually never appeared until the 1960s. It was never in any account of Darwin at all. Mm -hmm. And I had, Nobody had noticed this. I mean, nobody was looking for it. I wasn't looking for it. I just stumbled on it by, by, by reading through all these biographical accounts. And that has become a, a, a major industry in uh, Darwin studies. There are people who've made their careers on a particular explanation for why Darwin held back his theory that no one had ever thought of going back and thinking, well, did that even happen at all? Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John. We've got one more question in the chat. This is a very juicy one. Did Fitzroy suicide due to Charles' theory of evolution or was it due to personnel? Oh, mm. yes. Oh, that's Thank you for question. asking the question, Camille. Yeah. Um, Fitzroy was upset by Darwin publishing his theory. And we know that at the Oxford meeting for the British Association for the Advancement of Science in 1860, where Darwin's theory was first um, publicly debated, that Fitzroy, it was a public meeting, so there were uh, uh, men and ladies present. We know that Captain Fitzroy stood up and held a Bible aloft and said, trust in this, not man. So after the voyage to the Beagle, he had uh, converted to becoming an evangelical Christian, which he had not been during the voyage. Mm. And that's another myth. Very often you'll see Darwin and Fitzroy in documentaries fighting about religion on, uh, uh, on the voyage of the Beagle. Not so. They were on the same side. They were close friends. But after he came back, he uh, married his longtime fiance and became a real evangelical Christian and denied the age of the earth and everything. So, I mean, people thought he was bonkers. So he did have that um, side to him, but he was also very emotionally unstable. And uh, his suicide was, was due to depression. He'd had a lot of um, big career setbacks. He had been briefly governor of New Zealand and had been reca recalled in shame because of complaints against his leadership. Uh, so yeah, he, um, he suffered a lot from depression and he took his own life with a razor. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. John. We've got uh, two more questions. I like this first one. After COVID times, for those who wish to travel, could you recommend some places that are significant in Darwin's, uh, Darwin and or Wallace's journey? Galapagos Islands obviously comes to mind, but the remoteness makes it quite expensive. Indeed, but um, I think that's part of the pleasure is visiting someplace um, remote and off the beaten track. Now, Darwin went all the way around the world. So there's lots and lots of places you, you could visit, but particularly he uh, spent most of his time in South America. Wallace was actually here uh, in Singapore, and he visited very many islands in what is now Indonesia and Malaysia. So it's very easy to visit um, Wallace sites. But the ones that are less heavily visited, I think hold more interest. So for example, I think I'm the only Darwin scholar who has retraced Darwin's footsteps in Tahiti <laughs> because I was invited to, to be filmed in a documentary there um, in 2010. And I, would, I had a printout of his original pocket notebook and was able to go up the valley with a guide and to see the things he had recorded, the cliff faces, the birds, the unusually large um, native banana tree with huge, with these large uh, trunks and so on. So to, to it's, it, it's quite fun uh, to go to one of these places visited by these, these famous early naturalists and to take something that they wrote that's relevant to the place. And sometimes you will get an insight that that you will not get otherwise. <clears throat> that something that they referred to maybe didn't make sense, but when you go to the place, um, it does. Like if you, if you went to the Galapagos, if you saw the uh, expanse of very fresh lava fields with almost no plants growing on them, Darwin's expressions uh, describing the scenes would, uh, yeah, would, would mean more. Uh, or for example, his first visit to uh, a tropical forest in Brazil and the euphoria that he felt at seeing nature in such vibrancy. Right, this is a hugely thrilling thing, especially from a, a boy from temperate England. Dairy Farm, yes. Uh, there's a, actually a Wallace Trail at Dairy Farm uh, with a, uh, some signs with uh, some text about Wallace. Uh, the but there's, not, there's nothing on, else to see from... Hmm. Huh? We, we yeah. went on a trail there before, actually, for the Humanist Society. We saw that. That's right. Yes, you did hmm. a few years ago. Um, 
they've remade that trail since then. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's got all new signs and so on. But there's, yeah, there's no 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 traces of, of Wallace uh, in Singapore because, of course, there are no old buildings. <laughs> I mean, they, they've all been replaced over and over and over again. So uh, let me think now. No, no, there's there's no building in Singapore that Wallace was ever in uh, that still survives, unless he went into um, what is now the Asian Civilizations Museum. I forget what it was back then. It was the post office or it was a government building back then. Uh, and it was already one of the oldest buildings back then. Yep. Uh, so he may have gone in that. Who knows? Mm. But yeah, it's it's great fun uh, uh, tracking down these people. In fact, someday maybe I'll write a book on uh, retracing Wallace's footsteps because I yeah. have been now yeah. to quite a few of the islands uh, that he visited, including um, uh, far away Ternate and Halmahera, which was almost almost that's almost to New Guinea. Um, yeah, but it is great fun. A, yeah, a travel guidebook for when the pandemic is over, yes. <laughs> so we've got two yeah. more questions in the chat. Uh, so here's one question. What aspect about Charles Darwin remains unanswered to this day that you are most interested in and would like to find an answer to? Given how much there has been written about him, I'm surprised there are bits that remain unanswered, are there? There always will be, that's just the nature of, uh, of history. But I can't answer that question because usually uh, we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> so it's not that, oh, there's some mystery that we want to go out and well, solve well, there it. There must be years, though, certain parts of his life that we really don't know very much about. It seems to be well, I would, say, I would say the, um, the years that he spent working on his theory of evolution, um, you know, we have a lot of notes and so on, but if we could go back in time or somehow find out um, what that was really like, I think that would be a very interesting part of his story. Because that's, I think, what one of the first things that interested me about Darwin was knowing that he had spent this long part of his life in which he knew the truth. He knew that life on Earth evolved and he knew that we were descended from earlier species. And for a long time, only he knew it. And what, what must that be like to be the only one in the world who knows this? Um, I, I've always found that rather intriguing. Yeah. Thank you. We've got uh, one more question. Why did Darwin have to write the book on orchids if he hated them so much? Hmm. And, and led him to write that hilarious <laughs> letter about how he hated everybody and everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, how in good this, questions. I love this. Your is, this is actually it's actually very typical for Darwin that all of his projects take decades, and that's another problem with people saying that. Well, why did he take twenty years to publish *The Origin of Species*? Well, he took longer than that to do all of his other book projects, and nobody has a theory about him delaying those. Some of them thirty-seven, one of them forty-one years after he has an idea for something before he publishes the book on it. So sometimes he starts on something and he's quite keen on it. He's very interested, but after a while he gets sick of it. Like the barnacles, right? When Darwin spent eight years working on a complete worldwide taxonomy of barnacles. And he had always been an expert in marine invertebrates and he had started off uh, very keen. He was, he was dissecting with his hands again. He wasn't just writing books all day. He was using his microscope he was making lots of discoveries about um, this family of animals, but it just dragged on and on until he was sick to death of them. He wrote to a friend, I hate a barnacle as no man who has ever lived, even more than a sailor on a slow sailing ship. <laughs> That's intense uh, hatred. The orchids, to be honest, I'm not familiar with Darwin hating orchids. Um, Certainly in the early days, he absolutely loved them. And his son remembered uh, after his father's death, 
seeing his father go to the greenhouse and, and gently touch the petal of a flower and which he was experimenting on. And, and, and he thought that um, even though he was a, a serious scientist, he really had this emotional bond with the natural world, but he truly loved it. It wasn't just cold objectivity. Yeah, there must have been a lot of wonder. Any other questions uh, from, from anyone else? <laughs> You're welcome to either unmute or raise your hands, which, uh, which is a feature you can do in Zoom. No? Yes, hello, Chi Hao. John, are there any film or television depictions of Darwin that you would uh, recommend? Oh, gosh. I do have a collection of these which I've been gathering up. Um, I do. But it would be quite... Well, nowadays it's probably on YouTube. Actually, it is, yeah. You can get a hold of this. Uh, it's called The Voyage of Charles Darwin from, I think it's 1978. Uh, so it's quite old, but I would say it's the most accurate film I've ever seen of Darwin because almost all the dialogue, it's a multi-part part series, I forget how many, maybe five, but almost the entire dialogue spoken by everyone is, is real, actually taken from, from letters and, and books and so on. Whereas as time goes on, it seems to me that uh, films of Darwin get less and less accurate <laughs> and that you get almost none of his actual verbatim words or words of people from his time and that um, modern filmmakers just make it up. Oh, oh, for example, you might have seen that 2009 film, uh, Creation. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah the yeah. subtitle, by the way, is The True Story of Charles Darwin. Well, I'm sorry to say that it is the most untrue story of Charles Darwin I have ever seen. The film is so completely fictitious that the only thing real in it are the names of the people. I mean, yes, there was a Charles Darwin. Yes, there was an Emma Darwin. There was a Huxley. But all the words in their mouths are fake. And the issues that drive the story are just completely fake. That Darwin is torn to pieces, doesn't know whether he should publish his theory. Yep. Made up. Yep. Um, Huxley, the most famous line in the movie is Huxley says, Well, it's time to publish your theory. You've killed God, sir. <laughs> he says it twice. Huxley never said this. I mean, okay, maybe it makes great cinema, but it's just as fake as can be. So, yeah, that, that older film, the, the Voyage of Charles Darwin, extremely accurate. Um, the historian who was a consultant on that, John Hodge, is a dear friend of mine. Um, he's retired now. But uh, yeah, that's a very reliable series. And it's got a lot of science in it, which is nice. Um, so there's a, you know, some geology and some... Biology. We've got the link to this earlier film in the chat. Uh, we've also it, got a couple of people sharing different links creation. in the chat. <laughs> Including yeah. Christine. Don't, Christine Chua. Don't watch the creation movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, terrible. yeah. Skip that one. Go scroll <laughs> up a little bit to uh, the voyage of Charles Darwin, or a little bit lower down to the Darwin Online uh, link there. Okay, I'm going to give it just another couple more seconds to see if there are any more questions. Um, you want to raise your hand? So, Adam, do you just raise your hand again? John, uh, thanks, Shamima. Um, sorry if I missed this during the introduction, but. How did you know you taken you took on this monumental task of studying the life of mountains of of information as you described it? Um, what what was your what was your childhood like, and how did you come to spend your life in this? <laughs> well, I started out uh, in in history. All of my degrees are in history, and I gradually moved back through time. Uh, so I think when I was a teenager, I was interested in World War II, and I, um, I even learned German, which I thought I would use in my historical research and, <laughs> and never, never really did. Um, so I moved back in time, and by, by the time I was doing my PhD in Cambridge, I became a, a part of a, 
of the, the sort of the social group of people in the history of science department. I began going to their events and so on. And although Darwin is just a one part of that whole field, he still he's a big part. And that's when I began to encounter him uh, more and more, and also to encounter some of the leading historians who had uh, written about him. So, you know, piece, <clears throat> piece by piece, my interest in Darwin uh, took off from there. I certainly didn't uh, uh, have foreknowledge of where I was going. <laughs> uh, that's only with retrospect. Cute dog. <laughs> I would introduce you to my cute cat, but she's not here. Sometimes when I lecture to my students, when the, when the lecture is over, I'll hold up my cat uh, for them to see which they really like. That's one of the unexpected um, things about this COVID era, isn't it? That thing, we do some things less formally than we used to, right? I mean, I, I lecture to students from my living room, which they would never have seen my private space before or see my cat or sometimes afterwards we just get chatting in a way that we we wouldn't have before so even though we we don't actually see each other physically um the formality oh another place you see this drop in formality is a lot of the um american chat show hosts uh, you know there's uh, the th three four five of them they've been um holding their shows from home. And I think all of them, except for John Oliver, have ceased wearing suits and ties. So they, they're in a less formal setting and they dress less formally. Um, yep. I don't know, just an observation. I took your module 10 years ago. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, we've got a great crowd here today, very lively. But uh, if there are no more questions, I don't want to pull Dr. John back from a lovely afternoon or anyone else. So, okay, I think, yep, that's it. I don't see any more questions. Thank you so much, um, Dr. You. John, for this really cool afternoon. Uh, and thank you to Christine Chuar as well for joining us and also helping me in the preparation of this event and to the Humanist Society for putting this up. It's been a wonderful afternoon. Uh, you are all very welcome to unmute and say goodbye if you want. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much. Well, I'll leave the chat open for a minute or so if you want to say thanks in the chat. Bye, thanks very Dr. Much. John. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs> Hi, Shia. You... Hello, Kami. Hey, hi, Shia. Oh, anyway, um, I would like to show one of my fossils. It's a transitional form of artiodactyl, even hoof mammals. This is an oreodon. Oh, no. Wow. Oh, wow. North American. Uh, I think it's quite dark over here. What is this? This is a creature called... Oh, it's very dark. Hang on. It is an oreodont. Yeah, the skull. I think it's pretty dark. Never heard of an oreodont. Yeah. In fact, it is an, a primitive artiodactyl. Okay, and its closest modern relative, I think, is the camel. Whoa, okay, no wonder I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> okay, anyway, it's um, from the White River, uh, Oligocene Age in, yes, America. I've got a small collection of fossils, but not as exciting as yours. Okay, it's really very dark. I think that would be better. Okay, I think we can see clearly. Terry, did you see something out also? What is that? I'd like to share these with my wow. students when I can. Oh. You know, the usual things, ammonites and so on. What uh, yeah. what, what, what does Jerry Drawhorn have there? Yeah, yeah. What is that, that a femur? From North America. North America. And uh, it's from a species called Altocamulus, which I found actually it's multiple parts and uh, it, it turned me on to being a paleontologist <laughs> because it, it's broken up into many little bits and pieces. We had to glue it back together 
And uh, this would have been, uh, alta, alti means tall or elevated, obviously, altitude. And uh, it would have stood about 11 or 12 feet tall at the crown of its head. So very tall camel. That's and this is a similar bone from a bison. Uh, a, mo found mo a modern bison? Well, no, a fossil bison. Oh. bison uh, American version of bison primogenius. <laughs> so so um, both of these I collected when I was a boy. <laughs> wow. I, um, <clears throat> now, I, now Darwin, um, Darwin discovered a, a, a fossil creature uh, that's uh, now called uh, Macrochenia patagonica. But when he first got the bones back to London, he was mistakenly told that this was a relative of the llama, which Ooh. actually it isn't. <laughs> But this mistake was actually one of the things that inspired him to come up with his theory of evolution. The fact that he had found uh, fossil extinct things in the same place w where members of that family live today and, and ex exclusively live. And there seemed to be a relationship of these members of the same family being found in the same place, ancient extinct ones and living ones. So. He even though he, he was told incorrectly about the, it, it being uh, a type of llama, it was still a hint in the right direction. He'd found other things that really were um, <laughs> represented. Here's one, I'll, here's one I'll show you. This, this is a fossil um, trilobite, obviously, which I bought in Morocco. And guess what? I got cheated. Because if you look, you, you probably can't see this on the webcam, but if you look very carefully, the head is not perfectly aligned with the body of the animal. It's slightly askew. And only after I'd you know, taken it home and had a really, really good look at it, I realized that the head has been glued on. And they did it so cleverly. They've obviously mixed some of the matrix into the glue so that there's no difference in color where the head joins, but um, there is a little band of, of matrix separating the two. So I had gone through buckets and buckets of these tritobites and none of them had a head. And I said to one of the shopkeepers, oh, you know, I, I've got to catch my tour bus. Do you have any with heads? He said, oh yes, yes, I've got a special box over here. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it is a real, it is a real, um, Trilobite head from this species, but this, uh, yeah, this composite. This one. Mark is a composite. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Composite. There's actually a piece of a head um, of another individual in the matrix there. Oh well. Very enterprising chap. See a neat, fill a neat. Yep. <laughs> the um, Mel megalodon, right? Can yes. you so oh. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Yep, well, got what? one of those. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But yours is bigger. Uh, not too much by much, it's actually. Oh, here, okay, now, Jerry's found uh, some fossils. Um, I don't have that many that I've unearthed myself, but here are some uh, ammonites that yes. I unearthed at uh, Robin Hood's Bay in the north of England. It's a very famous uh, fossil site. The, the cliff faces there uh, are quite crumbly. I'm just walking along the beach there or looking at the cliff itself. Uh, it's possible to get some of these lovely yeah. ammonites. But the, the matrix is unbelievably uh, wow. strong stone. Yeah, it's mine too. Bad. Over here, there's another one. It's in very strong stone, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is very stable. I tried um, chipping away at one to clear it a little bit of the matrix and I broke it. <laughs> oh. Because <laughs> I just used too much pressure. And I, I see. Didn't know what I was doing. But I'm absolutely yeah. lo loving this show and tell. If there's anyone else who'd like to share anything. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. I'll show something. <laughs> what are you showing us? Oh, see, what is that? This is a sea urchin. It's a fossil, uh, St. Zose. Wow. Urchin. 
So basically, I went to Koito before COVID. Then I saw this shop selling for sales. In, it's like little ganja toys, but only this ganja machine was selling for sales into a toy. Wow. I think we yeah, so I got this. So this yeah. one is an Ichronoid. And it's a member, uh, it's a, some sort of prehistoric sand dollar, but you can still find sand dollar on beaches today. Yeah. This, the uh, prehistoric wasn't. And it dates about, say, it did miles in Yops 23 to 5 million years ago. So even if, but you still can find sand dollar on the beach today. So some of the zones hasn't really changed much. And this is one of them. This sand dollar can pass for any a modern sand dollar they may find on a beach today. Yeah, some things haven't changed very much. Um, the only fossils I've ever seen for sale in Singapore are these. These are um, shark teeth, uh, which you can get. Stones. They call it you can... stones back in the Victorian era. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> uh, but you can get these at, um, I got these at the uh, Science Center Singapore right. in, their, in their gift shop. Mm -hmm. And maybe the Natural History Museum here uh, has them as well. But all the rest of these are yeah, from other countries. Um, I have I have a nice ammonite from Madagascar. Um, wow. You can see the um, you can see the place where somebody struck the rock with a hammer to crack it open and reveal. So you've got the fossil and what's the name of the uh, the other side? Um, the negative or the, is it called a negative? I guess so. I, I, can't, negative. I can't remember. Negative? It's, it's, so it's like a mold. Yeah. In a jute. It's in a jute, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is also another one from Madagascar. I got. Ooh, that's a big one. Yeah. It's you can actually find them in a lot of our local feng shui shops. They're selling them like yes, them. I have seen a lot of those. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but usually <laughs> most of the shells have been polished, so much of the original materials were actually gone. It's only the sutures that you can see. Yeah, yeah, they do do that a lot, don't they? They polish them up. Um, mm. I've got on the shelf behind me there. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, chambered nautilus shell. Ah, um, which I was so delighted to, to find this uh, in a in a shop in Singapore because I had seen them for sale in Indonesia, but I was afraid to buy one because <laughs> I thought I might get in trouble importing it uh, into Singapore. So I found this one in a shop here, and it's been, it's been sliced in two. Yeah. So you can see the the chambers. Chambers. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. Exactly. So I wouldn't be surprised that, you know, people would believe more the fact that these are actually created rather than evolved because they will say, wow, you know, it is so mathematically, you know, concise that it has to require a creator. Yes. Um, yeah. And also when people began to find things like what we've been sh uh, showing each other, these, these fossilized remains, right, you can't find these alive anywhere. Right, that nobody's ever seen an ammonite swimming around or a dinosaur or one of Jerry's giant camels or, or whatever. So originally people thought, well, these must live somewhere far away in a remote part of the world. George Cuvier? Well, Cuvier was the, the naturalist who um, finally established the point of um of extinction because right. the idea of extinction had originally been thought to be very irreligious why would why would god see fit to create a species and then let it die out wouldn't that be like changing his mind and god's perfect this changes how could he have a change of mind so if he thought it was good enough to create something then it should still be around so mm. people thought the idea of extinction was, was irreligious uh, until it was, I mean, 
ultimately it was settled that they, look there really are things that are not around anymore and especially right. um, i mean you, you can argue about seashells and say well no, well maybe they live at the bottom of the ocean and we've never seen them right but you can't say that about a, a giant uh, a ground oh, yeah. sloth the or size a of a arm. car <laughs> or, and, and, and yeah things like the um, glyptodon and so on in south america and the megatherium these uh, or, or the, ma the mastodon um it was cuvier you just mentioned cuvier who was able to demonstrate that the bones of this elephant-like animal that had been found in north america were not an asian or an african elephant because the bones and the teeth were quite separate they were quite different so this was a third species and clearly there's no giant elephant thing running around North America that nobody has seen for hundreds of years while people have been there. There's just no way that thing is still alive, right? You can hide a mouse, but you can't hide a giant elephant thing. So that established that, okay, yes, there are things that were once alive that are oh, now yes, gone I... extinct. True, but what about uh, the views of Adam Segwick? I think he do not agree with Darwin on his publication on the theory of evolution, though he believed that there are eons to the ages on Earth, where he described, if I'm not wrong, the Cambrian, the Cambrian as well as the Devonian, and a few yes. of these ages where he actually found and Silurian. Yeah, Silurian. And he actually found certain fossils that were associated to those rock layers. Um, independently and this actually gave him a glimpse to the idea of you know there are catastrophic events in the past and those layers are not the deposit of a flood back in the deluge he mm. described so what yes. are your views regard to that well Sed uh, Cedric was an, an early geologist and a very religious man yeah and what's interesting from our perspective is how he combined those two, how he was one of the generation of, of religious geologists who had come to accept that the story of creation in the Bible was not meant to be literally true, that there had never been a global flood and that all the plants and animals didn't come into existence at one time, but that they had come and gone, come and gone. And he recognized that the fossil record was progressive. He said, he said all, of, all geologists accept this, but he saw this as the handiwork of God. Yeah. <laughs> like God, God had done it this way. And he said, you know, where did the new species come from? Your sun go extinct. You know, they die out, they go extinct, and then new ones appear. They were created. That was right. that was his answer. So yeah, just like, lots, lots and lots of creation. Yes, I like the idea of um, who was that guy, James Usher, who was actually saying that, well, according to his mathematical calculation, he thinks that the Earth was only some six thousand years old, something like that. And yes. I, do you think that Adam Sagwick actually disproved that, which, you know, his ideas were um, different. His, what he had found from those rock layers somehow goes in contrary to that. Yeah, you see, this 6,000 year um, idea, there's a lot of confusion about this. And there, there are people alive today yeah. who think that the world is 6,000 years old. And they think that this comes from the Bible, but it doesn't. It's as you say, it comes from Archbishop Usher centuries ago, who estimated uh, the age of the earth. And right. this, his, and, and many other people had done, had, had done similar estimates, but his became the authoritative one and was eventually, and this is where it gets tricky, was eventually added in the margins to some Bibles where there were editorial notes in the margin next to the text. And on the very first line, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. They printed 
4004 BC. All right. So <laughs> that's how some people misunderstood that the Bible itself offered this age or this dating, yeah, which actually it doesn't. It doesn't have any dates for sure. for those stories. So even yeah, even now there are people who, who think that's a biblical um, date that has to be, you know, that has more more weight and authority because it supposedly comes from the Bible, but True. actually it's it's from Usher. Yeah, another prominent figure I would say that actually I would say you know Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus himself, um, he was actually a Christian and more uh, iconically, he was also a Christian creationist whose discovery, okay, that humans and apes, when he look at all the evidence, he gathered all the traits that's found in the skeleton of man and apes, uh, non-human apes, and he found that there were actually no difference. There is nothing different. So he actually challenged the royal society to find evidence that hey, how, how is this possible that God made human as apes? So compare him and Sir Richard Owen, who actually lied, I would say that he actually lied, you know, when about his discovery, about his dissection of the anatomy. Um, Linnaeus is actually more honest, and I would say he's using the scientific method in deriving his um, data compared to Owen. And was that also the case whereby his statue in the Natural History Museum in London being shifted to the corner while Darwin became the center? <laughs> no, 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 oh, no. Really? That has nothing to do with it. Um, okay. Owen, Owen um, was the first director of that museum. Right. So in a way, it's his museum. And um, uh, originally, Darwin's statue was where it is today. Yes at the top of the stairs um and then after i forget when that was but after owen died and a statue was made of him his statue was put there as the founding director who had just died you know to honor him so it wasn't about demoting darwin at all it was just Hard. about it was just about honoring owen so <laughs> so for many years darwin was around the corner in uh, in what became the tea room <laughs> right now it's owen's owen's statue would be in the corner I don't remember where Owen is. Didn't he go upstairs? I think he's around the corner somewhere, if I'm not yeah, wrong. Yeah, but yes, so, but yeah. yeah. Uh, Darwin was put back. <laughs> yes. Um, center stage during 2009 right. with all the, you know, celebrations and commemorations and so on. But also true enough that um, Lanier's discovery, as in his publication, actually did shook the scientific, you know, community back in back in his days about Sorry, the who, who? Um, Carl Linnaeus. Uh -huh. Yes, I believe some of his works that he actually found that shows that men are still apes. Yeah, his anatomy. Well, it was he uh, categorized us as um, uh, as primates. Yes, somewhere that's around. that's that's the that's the issue you're talking about and. People found yeah. this objectionable. You know, hey, we're so special. Humans we are special. Be, we should be in a category of our own, not lumped together with the apes and monkeys. Right. And he quite rightly said, well, you point out any anatomical justification for, 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 putting, us, for we putting us in another box, and I will. But there aren't any. So he was a he was a creationist that we would in yes. modern modern terms we would say a creationist didn't think that um, living things can change. And he thought that the fact that you can classify the living world so precisely, you can put everything in its own little box, was evidence for God's design. Because it's so, it's so intricate, it's so complicated, that this was evidence of intelligence. Right. So... It's interesting how um, how there were so many compromises in this uh, in the early history of science, where people uh, reconciled their existing religious beliefs with the new discoveries they were making. You know, like there have been lots of creations instead of one, things like that. Right. Okay.
I, I have another uh, question for for John Adam, for John or Kemi or really anyone, but uh, I'll start with John. Like, um, you, you must be surrounded. I imagine you're constantly running into, uh, you know, people, scientific people spouting, you know, inaccuracies about Darwin. And so do you just smile and nod or do you try to go out of your way to correct them, educate them or what? I think I probably smile and nod, yeah. I, I tend to save my efforts for, um, for publications. So I don't take part in, um, you know, online uh, discussions and so on. I mean, one could, you could spend your whole life doing that. And uh, yeah, I, I don't find that very satisfying. It seems just too ephemeral. Uh, if I'm gonna put my energy and effort into something, I wanna, I wanna have something to show for it at the end of the day, like this. <laughs> It's real. Um, so no, I do, I do tend to um, smile and nod, unless it really matters. Unless someone, unless I hear people being misled, uh, then I will speak up, because um, I don't think that's okay. By the way, since we were doing show and tell, I pulled this out at the same time as my fossils. I'd love to show this to students. Um, this is a parchment. We've all seen fake ones in movies, but we've probably never seen a real one. It's a, a legal document, so it's quite boring, with a wax seal underneath, oh. from the year 1624. So I reckon this has got to be one of the oldest parch uh, oldest pieces of writing in Singapore, perhaps. 500 years old. I got it in an antique shop where um, they were but, selling but what these. What does it feel like? Um, it sounds it's, a bit plasticky, you know? Yeah, yeah, you're right. It is. It does sound like that, doesn't it? Yeah. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's thicker than than paper. Yep, yep. yep. Um, and it has more of a, a texture. It's not so smooth as more than paper. It, would it would it absorb oils from from when from your hands you know as you're touching it and my heart keeps shrinking thinking it should be behind some glass. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's really not worth anything. Um, right, right. Because there's such a vast quantity of old legal uh, documents that you know, I probably paid five pounds for this. Yep, yep. Because there are just so many of them. So, so when some not... horse stepped over my donkey and now she shall pay me so much in return. It's probably just stuff like that. Really boring. I've seen um, some really old, uh, I think, bits of writing from back Babylonian, Sumerian, that sort. And, and it was all just very mundane, you know. Three, three things in exchange for one thing. Here you go. Yes, yes. Um, the origin of writing does seem to have been about just boring um, economic records, like how many sheep do I owe you yep. and, and that sort of thing. However... Uh, uh, the Sumerians developed writing to quite a sophisticated level so that they actually did have um, personal letters and communication, not, not just economic records. In fact, the oldest, if, the oldest love letter ever discovered is from ancient Sumer. Um, I don't think I can repeat what it says. It's a bit dirty. <laughs> But it's actually from a woman writer to her lover, mm. um, asking, you know, when when are you coming over or something like that. Um, Netflix yeah. and chill and back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's I think that's well over seven thousand years old. Amazing. So in a way, um, nothing ever changes. I've got a <clears throat> I've got a reproduction here of a letter uh, by Darwin. Uh, this comes in. Uh, one of my books, I have a coffee table book with various reproductions in it. And I was showing some students this. Uh, paper was so valuable back then and, and, and um, the postage uh, would go up if you use a second sheet of paper. So what they would sometimes do as Darwin has done here is when he finished writing this way, he then wrote crosswise which is very oh. annoying <laughs> for us to read. Only a quote? 
No, it's just he just has terrible handwriting, that's all. Right. But then this reminds me of Leonardo da Vinci. But they didn't have envelopes back then. They hadn't been invented yet. Wow. So what they did was you first folded the sheet in half like this. Yep. Okay. And then, uh, let's see if I got this right. Then like, right. then the, uh, the short ends like that. And then twice more like that. And then this is where the um, wax, sealing wax would be put to hold the whole thing together. So this little uh, packet would be, is what letters looked like back then. In fact, the sealing wax was so strong, uh, such a strong adhesive, that when people open their letter, it would tear. Mm. Mm. And often what people would do. Letter opener? Uh, I don't think they had letter openers mm. until they had envelopes. Cut it open? But what, uh, what, no, you just pulled it. Um, but what happened was you would almost certainly tear the paper under part of it. Okay, but like they would pull a piece of the paper. So what people would do back then is when they wrote letters, they would leave a little blank uh, gap around where the sealing wax was going to go later because they knew that part of the letter would would probably get torn. I see. Mm -hmm. So that's some, a convention that you would see in old um, Victorian letters that of course has gone extinct. We don't do that. Cool. There's also no stamp. Mm. Right. Or the invention of the first postage stamp. Thank you very much, Dr. John. I think I'm going to call it an evening before the uh, allotted Zoom call runs out by itself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Anyways, but... Thank you, John, for signing this Ooh. previously. Yes, that was photographed by John. Oh, when was that? <sighs> okay, I remember meeting you at the National Library, I think a couple of years back, and you signed this for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. The last two paragraphs of Darwin's uh, Origins of Species, the, not, the original 1859 version, where he left out the, the creator. Yes. Because yeah. I think in the following year, I think the next edition, they actually added in he did, uh, yes. creator. So, uh, original, guess, the original text was um, um, uh, a, few, a few forms having been breathed into whatever and then he added breathed by the creator yes um, although he said in a letter later that he regretted truckling to public opinion and using this religious language in his origin of species all right anyway it's been a lot of fun everyone Thank you I, very wouldn't much. Have, I wouldn't have expected that we could have uh, <laughs> yes, yes, so yes. much Thank interaction. Thank you for giving us your time in this uh, show and tell. We had stories <laughs> to share. This was really, really cool. Thank you, everybody, for participating as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for hosting. Talking. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank, Thank you for, for the invitation. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye bye. Yeah. Same to you. Goodbye. Love you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Oh, by the way, will this video be um, shown somewhere? We do have a recording. However, yeah, so I will have to check in with the society to see what is okay, the plan sure. for it. I think for now, it's just okay. outside. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.